I'm going to call our regular meeting to order. Um, looks like we have four out of five of us, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So, um, all right. Let me just navigate to my agenda. So, first item is set adjust agenda. And oh, geez, I know we have a couple things to add. Well, I was going to say we we have an item, the item number eight about the pedestrian bridge. So maybe we could discuss the proposal at that point. Yeah, definitely. But um, uh, Casey had Casey had something too. I think a liquor have, license. Uh, yeah, uh, liquor item licenses. Item number nine for liquor license approval, and that's actually all we need to add. Oh, really? Nice. We're going to move the other item to June third because we have. Time. Oh, that's yeah. Right. 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 I remember yeah. that now. Um, okay, so we need a nine, which is a liquor license. Anything else that people need to add? Hearing none, uh, could we have a motion to add item number nine for a liquor license? So moved. Oh, I heard okay. Cherry first. I'll second it, or either way, yeah. I heard Cherry first. Wiz, are you the second? Yes, so Sherry to the motion, Wiz with a second. All in favor of approving the amendment to the agenda, please say aye. 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 Aye, aye, aye. Ayes have it. I'm gonna roll with that. Um, so next up is um, approved minutes from last time, which was the last regular meeting, which was May 6th and a special meeting on May 11th, so. What's your pleasure? You want to do those one at a time? You want to do, do them as a pair? Uh, I'll move that we approve both. As written? Yes, written. Second. second. Okay, so we've got a motion from Sherry, a second from Wiz, and discussion on the minutes. They were good. So all in favor, please say, of approving the minutes as written, please say aye. 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 All right, that's everybody motion carries and we're moving along. Next is communication from the audience. And do we have anybody online who wants to say anything that's not, we're not gonna hit later in our agenda. All right, hearing none, we're moving on. Um, next is town manager's report, Sean Fielder, you're, Final town managers report at a select board meeting. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Um, so uh, I'll hit a couple things here. Um, have been in contact with uh, John Jewett in regards to the transition uh, for uh, John coming in as interim town manager. So getting notes in order and obviously working closely with Casey uh, as, uh, in the business manager role, as well as department heads uh, on, uh, you know, just make sure we have a smooth transition. So. John and I have gone over a number of things already and uh, the middle of next week, we'll, you know, make sure that uh, he's briefed on uh, various items so uh, we can ensure for the good of operations, everything's in order. So we're right on target there. And, um, you know, I appreciate John, uh, John's willingness to be involved in the board working with him uh, in this interim period uh, while the board does uh, go through the process of getting the uh, permanent assignment in place. So just want to uh, illustrate everything's in good shape there. We uh, just a, a, a couple more things tonight because I know we've got a pretty uh, you know solid agenda. I just want to bring up that uh, for the June third meeting, we'll have more discussion on this subject. But the listers had come forward recently, uh, Jan and Jean, and uh, said you know we we think we probably want to be stepping out of the role of the listers assignment at the end of this calendar year. And uh, what they have uh, kind of talked about a little bit, and uh, I've had one planning meeting with them and talked with Matt from uh, New, England, uh, New England Municipal uh, Center, who uh, does our assessing services, just about some of the logistics. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, what, is, what would be investigated moving forward is, uh, do we consider, uh, you know, would the consider, uh, town consider, excuse me, uh, not having listers as elected officials moving forward and potentially consider um, you know, subcontracting some of these services. So obviously this could be a somewhat complicated discussion and there's some significant policy issues involved with something like this. So um, would plan, board should plan to uh, further discuss uh, you know, some of the logistics at the June 3rd meeting. 
and uh, just be advised if it's an elected position, what the uh, it is specifically noted in the town charter. If uh, it's the board's preference and the town's preference to go forward on um, not having the list of assignments in place, one of the logistical items is that to do this, uh, it would um, it would mean a charter change moving forward. So with a charter change moving forward, um, that would be something that we uh, the, the town would be working on through you know the next six to eight months. So that for the next legislative session, and what I mean by that is January of uh, 2022. The uh, it, assuming there is a change on listers, uh, there would be some other changes that could be considered on the charter. So that would be a parallel process, if you will. So that's as much as I wanted to note for this evening. And um, you know, one of the issues that we're up against is listers, as with some of these other assignments, um, you know, they are a stipend uh, paid position, but the demands um, are you know pretty high level these days, if I can just put it that way. So, um, you know, that's as much as I would want to offer. Uh, Jean um, Hackett indicated that, you know, she could be potentially available at the June 3rd meeting if there were any particular questions. My thought process on this is uh, get a little bit more of an update at the June 3rd meeting and then, um, you know, form, form a task force uh, like was done two and a half years back now when uh, we were looking at, uh, you know, who do we uh, use for assessor services just kind of an expansion on that and then just keep the conversation going. So just want to make sure this is kind of in the queue, if you will. Um, I'll change gears. And then if there's questions at the end, or if you want to hit them now, what's everybody's preference? Should I just keep moving, Eric? Okay. Um, we did, uh, we got good news. We have secured an additional award. You know, we've had a number of them this past uh, couple of months. We got word, um, uh, recently that we have from the Northern Forest Center, a grant award for improvement of access to the town of Hardwick uh, trails directly off the uh, LVRT. So that's a $10,000 award. Uh, Jeff Sawicki had been working with uh, Jason Boehner and other folks uh, uh, on behalf of the Hardwick trails group. So that's a, that's really a, it's a nice uh, improvement. Um, my opinion is we're going to have uh, continued and pretty significant demands for uh, folks who are going to be using LVRT. And if the town of Hardwick has an additional trail network um, in the town, town area, if you will, that I think everybody here knows this is a trail system that's used all four seasons, whether it's biking, walking, birding, mountain biking, winter skiing, you know, whatever the use might be. It's going to be a really excellent opportunity to pull people right off the LVRT and put them right onto the Hardwick Trail Network. Pulling my own experience in from uh, mountain biking, the way this generally goes is somebody uh, you know parks in town at one of the parking lots or downtown, does a ride with their friends or their family. The way it goes is they come back to their cars and then they patronize our businesses down. And this is a really good thing for recreation and economy. So it's. Uh, Thanks to Jeff and Jason for coordinating on this. They, you know, this is another nice thing to be receiving uh, at the town level. Um, just uh, let me hit two more things uh, for universal guidance. Um, you know, obviously the numbers are coming down significantly for uh, COVID results. And just so everybody is advised, what the town is doing for the office operations at various levels is we're continuing to follow the universal guidance. And basically what that is, is, um, you know, stay home if you're sick. Um, in a nutshell, stay home if you're sick. And then the other significant thing is for closed environments, um, it, there is at the state level, the universal guidance indicating, uh, you know, folks should continue to mask. You know, obviously we know Vermont is leading the nation in vaccinations, but we do have some folks that aren't vac vaccinated yet. Uh, and, you know, the town of Hardwick is not in a position to ask anybody if they're vaccinated or not, if they come to do business with us. So um, uh, in preference to our, uh, this is how I'll say it, in preference to our employees who have decided to get their vaccination, but they're not fully vaccinated yet, what we are doing is continuing to follow the universal guidance. So we're not uh, potentially putting them, them into a risk exposure situation. Uh, I think all of us know from following the state news, uh, you know, July 4th and or sooner, uh, it's going to be recommended guidance. And at that point, um, in many respects, we're back to normal business. So I just want to make sure uh, folks understand, you know, if you're coming to do business at given town offices, if you would please continue to wear the mask, we would appreciate it. We're open. Our office hours are back to normal for the various departments. 
and um, you know, it's frankly, it's been busy and that's good. So uh, uh, that's just a little bit on that. And then finally, um, I just want to say thank you. It's been an honor to serve uh, Town of Hardwick this two and a half years that we've had. It's been a crazy last 14 months, as everybody is aware. I'm truly honored that I've had an opportunity to work with some great people. And uh, Hardwick has some awesome, positive things happening. And, um, you know, just so everybody hears it, I decided a little while back that I just want to go a different direction in my professional career. And um, that's, that's the main reason for me making a change. I'm not upset with anybody. Um, not, as far as I know, the majority of the people are not upset with me. And we're uh, continuing to get a lot of positive things done. The department folks here, John coming into the role, the board that's here, uh, you know, whoever ends up in the assignment in the uh, permanent role as the manager will continue to advance this town. Uh, and uh, again, I say thank you for letting me be a part of that. So uh, that's what I'll close with. Awesome. And I'll, I'll uh, say the feeling is uh, reciprocated. We're grateful to have had you while you were able to be with us. And um, it has been one crazy year that we're hopefully coming to the end of and um of the covid part of it and um yeah yeah and you've you've really uh contributed to just an awful lot of projects around town there's a lot of stuff going on so thank you we really appreciate it well that's a good support from uh, the department folks and the town employees these are dedicated public servants and uh they uh, they really are working hard on behalf of this community. So I want to make sure folks recognize all these people at the grassroots level, it, it, boards and committees included, obviously. So uh, everybody's really working hard, sometimes behind the scenes to keep things rolling. So uh, thank you, Eric. I appreciate your comments. Yeah. Any questions for Sean? I do um, have a question. <laughs> I wanted to know. Um, I know LVRTs supposed to be doing some signage and stuff and I wonder do we know what their kind of rollout is what kind of time frame that is or do we not know yeah um, we um oh sorry Eric go ahead no go ahead you go yeah um what we know at this phase is that um you know they are uh, just everybody is on the same page uh -oh. over the of anything remaining aspects which was early last week is there's some bidding going out for some of the sections in the Hardwick area but I didn't get the clear indication that that would be done this year um, as an example um, I think what uh, is going to be happening is uh, some of the signage may not come in this uh, summer fall season it may be that it comes next year what they're doing because this is basically 60 miles of construction that remains out of the 93 miles um, what the VTrans group has uh, committed to now is we'll have this done in the next two and a half year period. So I guess that's what I could offer for right now. Eric, do you have anything else that should be added there? Um, for my understanding is VTrans is moving ahead. It seems with the bridges first. So, you know, they've been contacting Hardwick about the one over Standard Mountain Road. You know, they're working Wolka too. So I think bridges and then for signage, what we've done so far is we've collaborated with Ken Brown at Vast, who's been the LVRT manager. And so that, I mean, we have signage, like kind of, we're trying to put up signage, but it's on like wooden stakes and it's not permanent. Oh, okay. Okay. I just wondered how that rollout, how that's maybe going to happen. I, we have some other sign issues. And so I just didn't know whether they would play well together but it sounds like we need to just address some of our stuff like the the sign at the townhouse that says townhouse and depot is uh kind of falling apart so oh i'll bug john about that one and uh, we'll see whether we need to try to figure out how to get that either repaired or replaced or something because it's okay yeah not good right. but anyway right. okay that's all i got Nice. Any other questions for Sean? Last call. Question, Sean. Um, first of all, thank you. It's been awesome to serve with you over the past year. Um, thank you. And I just had a, it's a very quick random question. Are we, I know we got a grant um, for some bike racks and then also some kiosks. Is that, are we planning on putting those in this season? Yes. Great. How's that? Is that concise? <laughs> 
I'm not like that. You know that. Yes. <laughs> so uh, I, I'll nice get a little more. Sure. Yeah, we we had the uh, Vermont Outdoor Recreation Economy Grant that was in collaboration with the Vermont Community Foundation supporting that. So uh, we did secure uh, getting a number of bike racks and then adding some information kiosks. So this is one of those other items that um, John, in collaboration with Jeff Sawicki, uh, Community Development Coordinator, and uh, Tom will uh, take that and run with it. And the intent is that we get those in this, uh, this, this summer slash fall seasons. And are those, I know that the Planning Commission had some recommendations on bike racks. Is that also in collaboration with the Pedestrian Safety Task Force or is it kind of separate? Um, the, the bike racks, uh, so what we ended up being able to do and what we do have to do is check the commodity pricing. I think everybody knows pricing on things has changed. So even since we put in for this grant proposal, we had put a, a cost to uh, bike racks. The intent was for us to do seven or eight bike racks. And, uh, it would be those places that were recommended by the pedestrian traffic safety task force. And then uh, with the pricing we saw when we submitted the grant back in March, it would allow us to do some additional. Again, the, the wild card right now is, you know, what's the new price on the bike racks? That may drive how many we can do, if that makes sense. The intent is to cover those mentioned in the Pedestrian Traffic Safety Task Force report. Awesome. Thanks, Sean. Yep. Anybody else? Um road foreman report tom fadden tell us about your adventures <laughs> the last two weeks oh let's see where to start well down, i think downtown kind of speaks for itself what we've been doing down there for all the crosswalks and parking areas and and uh cleaning up the parks and stuff uh, that's pretty much all done downtown except for a few uh stop bars we gotta do a couple more handicaps and the parking area out from the tracy there uh, the mark goes for no parking. And I believe that's all we got left for downtown for painting. Uh, we're still waiting for the other paint to come in. Not quite sure when that's going to become because supply is uh, kind of slow these days. Uh, besides that, uh, we've been dealing with the water issue up on what we call the loop up on Glenside. Uh, come Monday, we're going to be up there exploring a little, little bit around some shutoffs. Um, we do still have a situation with the pump house up there uh, that is actually running almost like inside your house now with a pump. Uh, we're still waiting for the parts to come for that. Uh, well, house number one is back online. Uh, dropped the samples off on, uh, I think it was Friday afternoon. Uh, Kenny got the samples back. So that's back online as of uh, Tuesday morning. Uh, so both pumps are up and running. Uh, we've completed the second round of grading on everything. Uh, roads are holding up good, thanks to the nice dry weather so far. Uh, besides that, the guys have been working on the upper part of the town farm up on Bridgman Hill. They got that whole area up there all completely ditched, so we need to get the hydro seeder next week and get that done. Uh, I met with Doug Morton uh, from NBDA there about Bridgman Hill. He gave me the green light to go ahead and fix that up. So. We're starting from the brook and going all the way up to uh, Beverly uh, Shepherd's house, uh, ditching that and stone line and all that. And I think that's about covered it. Uh, flags are up. Banners are up. Let's see. Mowing, of course, that's a continuing thing every week. That one's going. So things are looking good. Awesome. Um, oh, you, uh, Tom, you regraded the uh, triangular park as well. Yes. Yep. Yep. Downtown. Yeah, put a little mouth in there, made it look pretty. Tom, I had a really quick question. Um, uh, yeah, the downtown's looking great. <laughs> I saw you guys out there early yesterday. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sweeping downtown looks particularly good. Um, <laughs> but I was just asking, I just came up at a select like, board meeting uh, a, a while ago. How are we, how are you feeling on, on water in general? Because it has been, has, has been kind of dry. Oh, no, we're fine. I mean, even our dry, dry spells there, our wells down there are awesome. Uh, we don't really lose that much down there. Uh, you know, even the driest summer of last year, I mean, our wells were completely fine. So, Awesome, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Just, I, I checked on the, uh, just for the good of the conversation, I checked the uh, Northeast Drought Monitor today, and 
um, the, the north border of the Hardwick town uh, boundary is basically a line between um, abnormally dry and then uh, light drought, if you will. So, you know, with the moisture that we've seen this past couple week period, you know, it takes a long time to catch up when we had deficits like we had last year and then snow drought from the winter. But, um, you know, we're, we're gaining a little bit of ground. So uh, hopefully we'll continue to gain that ground on uh, moisture. I, Which one are we, abnormally or slight drought? It's abnormally dry is the correct classification. You said not, it's a borderline. Not drought. Line. Yeah, it's, the, no, it's, it's borderline it, between one and the other. But you didn't say which which one applies to us. Yeah, the uh, the town of Hardwick is in the abnormally dry area, just to our north. Effectively, Greensboro and to the northeast is uh, moderate drought. So we're right on that hairy edge of moderate drought. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, Tom, I just had one other thing I was going to add to your, your report, which is, I think we're meeting next, uh, next week, Wednesday with the VTrans group about the repaving for next summer. Is that right? That's correct. Yep. And, and we have, um, Doug Morton is joining that. I think he said. I believe so. Uh, yeah. If I remember talking to him there on Wednesday, I believe he said he was going to be over here. Uh, the other note there, uh, too, we did manage to get up these hard stop bars are done up there, plus their crosswalks also done. Uh, awesome. So, and I don't know, I don't know if Mike's going to be there tonight, Mike Sullivan, because everybody in town's been asking what the light department's up to. So. Oh. Yeah. Uh, All right. Uh, um. He's on the agenda, so maybe he'll. So okay. the, the meeting with VTrans, is that an open meeting, or is that just you guys, or how does that work? So um, it could be open. We should probably warn it if we end up with a lot of select board members. I just know the Planning Commission was interested in knowing about that, so I could, depending on what time it is, I could maybe go just to be able to report back to them or something. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, I think we already have quite a crew. Um, so I know I want to go, Tom, John. Um, we have Doug Morton from NVDA, who's our transportation guy regionally. Um, we have a, um, a representative from Local Motion. Um, there's a engineers from Du Bois and King and somebody from VTrans, so it's... Okay, well, yeah. We'll but wait. yeah, I'll, I, I'll forward to you. i can see what time it is and I can get away, but yeah, I'm interested to know. Okay, I'll forward it to you. Okay. Okay, if okay. I forget, bug me. Should I share it with you okay. here? No, I, I will. Can. <clears throat> All right, mm -hmm. um, thanks, Tom. Yep. All right, so we're gonna move on to police report. Aaron Cochran's online. Aaron, tell us what you guys have been up to. Sure. Uh, first, I wanna to thank Tom and uh, a couple of his guys that came up uh, this last week, uh, raking, cleaning up after snow plowing, et cetera, really um, um, you know, helped dress up around the uh, public safety building. Uh, looks really good around there. So I uh, appreciate their work. Uh, that they did this last week up there. Um, and I also met with uh, Lisa Fecto's mother today. Uh, she came in and, we, you know, to update uh, as to where we're at with uh, bench. They are working on uh, the bench, um, as I discussed before. So that's uh, in progress. Uh, Kenny Lacasse has been helping me um, look at uh, flagpoles, et cetera. Kenny has pretty good knowledge of, you know, what's needed and where to get them and so on. Uh, so I updated uh, Lisa's mom on that. So, you know, we're moving forward with that, hope, hoping to have the bench and flagpole in place by uh, July 4th uh, is our plan there. So uh, that project is underway. Um, uh, another thing we've been doing as far as the department goes, uh, as I said, we did have the governor's highway 
uh, money this year come in and we have uh, been utilizing that and doing a lot of extra patrols which have included a lot of uh, still cell phone violations uh, people still uh, using cell phones uh, while they're driving which as we know is a huge distraction and so we've been uh, you know really looking at uh, highway safety uh, infractions and, and uh, trying to um, educate and deal with those those issues uh, through the governor's highway uh, safety program grant money that we received. Um, <clears throat> uh, Officer Marcu, uh, he is finishing up uh, his firearms instructor. We didn't have a uh, firearms instructor, and obviously uh, we need that uh, to uh, qualify annually and so he's been going through the uh, instructor program at the academy and is finishing up uh, that program as should be done early june uh, so we'll have a you know we'll have our own firearms instructor uh, which will be great we've had to rely on some other agencies as we didn't currently have one and uh, that's a logistics nightmare uh, to get another agency to come in and qualify everybody uh, for the annual firearms qualification. So uh, we're working through that. <clears throat> we have done some um, annual training such as uh, CPR and um, first aid. Uh, we got that done and, and out of the way. Um, so we continue through that. Um, Officer Marcu will be leaving for basic uh, in July. We do have a date in July. He'll be leaving. Uh, uh, basic training uh, through the National Guard. So he'll be doing that in July. So he'll be gone for uh, about six months there. So uh, so we're trying to prepare and get, you know, get set up and ready, ready for that. Um, our part-time officer that we just appointed, he's been working some as well, doing uh, field training. Everybody that, that was a funny face, Eric. <laughs> uh, Everybody that um, uh, we hire on, uh, regardless of whether they're certified or not, still uh, goes through a, a field training program so that uh, we're comfortable with their knowledge and their knowledge of the area, as well as, you know, laws, et cetera. So um, he's finishing up that uh, FTO program. It's going very, very well with that. Uh, we've had another uh, individual who is uh, also currently certified that has worked part-time, is interested in part-time. So uh, it's starting to help fill up our, um, you know, part-time that I, I had talked about um, that would help us utilize the, the part-time people. So um, other than that, uh, of course, working on budgets. Uh, just one thing I did want to mention, I know the Gazette article uh, as of the last meeting had said that we didn't have any changes in the budget, um, but uh, we did. Um, so I just wanted to make note of that. We're, I know we're going to talk about that a little later, so I won't go into that now, but um, yeah, but obviously we did have, you know, I've been through the budget and we've been working through this. Um, Casey, uh, Sean, myself, Eric, you know, we've all, all been working on this. So, uh, so we've been, you know, working on that as well. Uh, and I think that's kind of where we're at now. I've, Trying to keep it short because I know we have a lot to to go over. <laughs> Great, thank you. Questions for Aaron. All right, so we're going to hit the budget, which is the big thing um, later. Uh, in the I think it's an item number three. All right, so. Thanks, Aaron. And um, moving along, item number one, we have Emily Rosenbaum with Lamoille Area Health and Human Services Response Command Center to present about the collaboration among area health and human services organization. Welcome, Emily. Thank you. I am just texting my co-collaborator because he's not on yet. Ah. But I can start. All right, great. So thank you for having us tonight. Um, if it's okay with you, I'm going to share screen. Uh, Do you have go. that? Yeah, there we go. 
Um, mm -hmm. So I appreciate you taking the time to hear from us tonight. Uh, Greg Stefanski from Capstone may or may not be joining us. Um, at the start of the pandemic, um, Copley and Lamoille Restorative Center both thought, you know, we need to find a way for all of our different organizations to be pulling in the same direction in this unprecedented situation. And fortunately, um, they talked to each other and they knew they were both doing this and they decided to work together and they, they sort of pulled together um, a lot of the um, Morrisville Health Area um, nonprofits and the ones that all work in health and human services. And so that covers um, Lamoille County, Hardwick, Greensboro, Craftsbury, um, all of the people who are covered by the Morrisville Health Area. And they started pulling them together and they pretty quickly realized that there needed to be a structure, there needed to be some support for all doing this work together. And so they looked to the ICS, the Incident Command System, which comes out of FEMA as a possible model for doing this work together. And they, they took that, they adapted it, and you'll see up here our three commanders, our Lamoille Restorative Center, Heather Hobart, Greg from Capstone, and Corey, who um, is in quality at Copley. And they came, they brought all of us together, they brought all of us in, and if you look down here, we really focused in on five areas that seemed critical for the pandemic, housing, medical employment, uh, mental health and substance misuse, and food. And everything else that's on here, and this is more than 20 organizations here, and there's more than 30 organizations involved, um, everything else that's on here is in support of this. So you'll see we have public information and safety and operations, planning, logistics, all of that's really in support of these five operations groups. And as it's developed, you know, we were meeting a whole heck of a lot, and then we sort of winnowed it down and began meeting um, less frequently. So now we meet at this point every other week. Um, and, oh, there's Greg. I'll let Greg take it from here, and then I'll take it back after he's done explaining what we've done. Awesome. Hello, folks. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to meet. Emily, thank you for getting the ball uh, rolling. And uh, yeah, as, as Emily is pointing out, it was, uh, you know, it's quite a structure that was pulled together um, and, and really unprecedented across the Lamoille Valley for so many organizations to be working on some, some common goals together. But, um, but, you know, we were becoming aware very quickly that the impacts, you know, were beyond what, you know, we've seen before. Thankfully, not so much on the, the medical side as, as the infection rates were relatively low uh, across the state and in our communities, but um, it certainly brought to light the challenges that folks were facing in the area of housing. So all of a sudden we found ourselves um, trying to figure out how can we provide housing for, uh, you know, what usually averages around 120 people who are experiencing homelessness, usually with the about 30 of that number being uh, children. Um, and how can we provide food uh, for them? So we, the needs were significant. And, and so thus uh, the, the call for multiple partners coming uh, together. Uh, our planning team was able to meet with uh, different groups and individuals, gather data to help us make decision, set strategic goals. And as Emily mentioned, um, when we, our structure first came together, we were meeting three times a week and setting new objectives uh, each time that we met. We've been able to dial things back now to every two weeks, um, but it's still the same process. Uh, scanning, assessing what's going on in the community. Um, we're really concerned again about housing because as some of the state guidelines change, uh, that number of 120 people who are experiencing homelessness will uh, no longer be able to stay at the hotels where they have been and uh, when the governor lifts uh, his executive order, some of the food resources will no longer be available. So we, um, as excited as we are about um, positive numbers and things improving across the state and country and around the world, those big changes mean um, impacts on vulnerable populations in our community. And so, and that's what this group has been all about. Uh, I really wanna highlight Emily's work as our public information officer. Um, and I'm, I'm guessing as uh, select board members and concerned uh, citizens in, in the community of Hardwick, you uh, know the value of good communication. 
uh, Emily has built uh, a, a communication machine um, that includes the newsletter uh, that she's sharing right now. We have a newsletter that goes out every week, uh, really looking at all these broad, diverse areas. Uh, Emily chooses a sharing priority to really hone in for our group, a focus on a particular area. Um, right now, obviously, vaccinations so critically important, and we've really been trying to promote that information. But we look at issues of substance misuse and mental health and how the community is being impact impacted. We make sure that if there are any food resources that are available, that those are being shared. We reach out to specific groups, parents, seniors, um, our, any of our, you know, our uh, population that, uh, you know, working on farms in the community. Um, Emily really dials the information into the specific groups who need it. Uh, this newsletter goes to over 600 uh, individuals across the Lamoille Valley and um, dozens of groups and then gets shared within those groups and organizations. Um, we've used uh, social media platforms. We have a YouTube channel um, using uh, videos as a way to uh, highlight getting vaccines. And uh, the probably one of the best decisions our group made, and this happened within days of coming together when we had a dozen or so organizations saying, hey, I'm gonna start a list of resources in our community. And someone had the wisdom to say, if we start dozens of lists, none of them are gonna be current and accurate, and it's gonna be a nightmare. We chose the uh, website for the United Way of uh, Lamoille County as our uh, container to hold all this information. Emily has worked with Clarissa French uh, from the United Way. This website gets updated, I'd say almost on a daily basis. And it has the most up-to-date information about housing, the organizations that provide supports there, and just about every other basic need uh, that you can think of. And as you, you know, reflect back on this last year, and I imagine as leaders in the community of Hardwick, you've probably heard people saying, I need help uh, paying my utility bill. I don't have food. Um, my car, does the, the, the tank's running on empty. Any kind of a need that you can imagine is, is most likely gonna be covered on this United Way um, resource page. And uh, it's been a phenomenal place and, and, and phenomenal to have one place to refer folks, both folks who are in need, but also our service providers. Uh, we've heard from our faith community partners saying, we're getting people who come to us for help. We don't know where to send them. We just make sure, do you have the United Way resource page? Because you'll know where to send folks. So that's just a little bit about some of the tools and the structure, as I mentioned, the communication, planning, really the game changers um, in the health and human services world to have those kind of resources. Uh, and we've been fortunate that so many folks have volunteered their time and their skills uh, to make that happen. And we've had quite a few successes. And, Emily, I don't know if you had a chance to share uh, maybe one or two of those examples of what successes looked like, um, but I'll uh, pause and pass the baton back to you. I'm gonna share two if I could, Greg. I have two um, in my pocket for today. Um, and we have lists, long lists of successes because when everyone's pulling in the same direction, you get results. Um, so one example I'm gonna give that has been amazing um, is that we did a real push when folks were shut down and locked down to make sure that harm reduction to go packs were um, got into the hands of people who were um, dealing with substance use. And we've also done a real push to get Narcan into the hands of everybody. And this has involved several different organizations and public information and planning. And we have saved I don't know the exact number, it's more than, it's at least four lives have been saved by Narcan being out in the community since this started. Um, and when we do a push for it, there's a demand for these, um, these bags. And one of the things we're really trying to work on is some of the destigmatization work around, um, around substance um, use issues. And we've seen some real partnerships with our houses of worship. We've seen some real partnerships around the community through the work we've done to connect different people. 
The other example I'm going to give is a very tiny one, but it makes me really happy, um, which is that we put out a call. Um, there's a summer exploration program for youth for careers um, that DJ Massey brought us and we put it out and he heard right back from a child care center that wants to bring in a youth to do some training in child care um, this summer so that we can start to deal with our pipeline issue when it comes to child care. So we've seen so many of these successes. Um, and one of the things that really makes me so very happy is when I hear from someone, I was in a meeting and I didn't know where to find blah, 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 blah. So I went to the United Way page, which I kind of do all the time too, because there's so much on there. I can't remember everything that's on there. If you get the newsletter and two weeks later, you're trying to, you know, you skim it, right? You're not going to read the whole thing. If you skim down it and then like two weeks later, you're like, there was something in there and I can't remember what it was. Just go to the United Way resource page if you can't find the email. Um, because I every week after I put together that newsletter, we update the um, resource page. And it's very helpful if towns have it on their website. It's very helpful if law enforcement is aware of it. Um, the more we can have folks really super duper aware of that page, the more we know that when you're at the gas station talking to someone and they're asking you a question, the person they're asking is gonna know that that page is there and is a resource for them. So that's it for me. Greg's going to add something. Well, I, I, you know, I love these meetings when you don't know who you might see. And I see Kaylee here with us. Uh, hey, Kaylee. Uh, Kaylee is a part of one of the newer teams that we launched within Las Rock, our school and, and child care team. Uh, at one of the meetings where we had partners from uh, schools at our three supervisor unions in the area, at some of our child care partners, uh, a few of the members mentioned that they were noticing an increase in calls to DCF um, for concerns about the well being of children and also calls and connections with Clarina Howard Nichols Center and concerns about potential interpersonal violence. So, we, we that group meets uh, once a month. And so, that issue was brought to our attention. Uh, within a few days, Emily was pulled in as public information officer, as well as representatives from DCF and also Becky Ganya from Clarina Howard Nichols Center. Um, the, there's some research done to check the data and to see, yep, there's been an uptick in calls specifically to DCF around children. And also the numbers for calls to Clarina were uh, getting back to where they were pre-COVID. We had a real significant dip that was a concern for us. Um, Emily worked with Becky, developed a few messages. Uh, em, uh, Becky then went and visited uh, staff at the uh, different supervisory unions to share information about what to look for if you're a teacher or a school staff person, and then what to do if you suspect that something's happening to an adult or to a, a child. And that all that work happened by the time we got to our next meeting. We were able to report uh, that because of a concern that was raised, it was investigated, some data was checked, a plan was developed and implemented within a matter of a few weeks around a very sensitive topic. Um, so that's the, the nimbleness that we're now seeing when we bring multiple organizations and um, these extra resources when it comes to communication and, uh, and planning. And uh, like Emily mentioned, um, and I see Chief Cochran as a part of the call, our first responders having this information and um, I think I, I, I think I'm carrying with me here if I in my wallet, I now carry um, these cards that we had printed up um, with QR code and the website to get you to the United Ways uh, resource page. So we'd be happy to, to get some of these if they'd be helpful to have at the town clerk's office um, with law enforcement, firefighters or other first responders in the community. Because when we know when law enforcement and firefighters are involved, there are likely some other things going on that might need attention. So, so we really appreciate you giving us time to share a little bit about where we are. Uh, as we look ahead and we look at communities and schools going into recovery plans and resilience plans, um, we are continuing to work together and um, would love to be a part and support uh, Hardwick uh, in any ways that you might see possible. And we're happy to further brainstorm with you. But again, we appreciate the time to meet with you all tonight. And uh, again, nice to see some friendly faces uh, on the Zoom call. Thanks. And we're happy to take any questions. I'm sorry about that interruption. When you hear a splash in the pond and no one has told you they're going into the pond, it warrants looking out the window. Um, can we answer any questions for you? I, I do have a little question. 
<laughs> the dog's barking now. So um, <clears throat> I'm confused about the Lamoille County reference. Like we're in Caledonia County. So I, I just feel like that sometimes I've looked at the newsletter. It comes into our, our select board mailbox, but uh, I've, I've been confused. Like I think, well, well, but we're in Caledonia County. So how do you, um, is it just everywhere, you know? <laughs> it's the Lamoille, it's the Morrisville health area. So we, we if you look at the bottom of the email, it always explains it. We drew the okay. boundary on the Morrisville okay. health area. Okay. Um, and because that also affects a lot of the health and human services orgs that um, service you, especially housing is particularly, you're particularly stuck with Lamoille when it comes to, to housing, but a lot of this, also the food really, food has okay. been a, really a part of that too. So okay. that was that was how we drew the boundaries. Okay, that sounds good, thank you. But, but Sherry, you bring up a really good point that when you look at uh, this, the designations for supervisory unions, uh, when you look at the Agency of Human Services designations for service area, the hospital service areas. So yeah. we, 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 uh, we like to talk about the Lamoille Valley and we really see we're, we're connected in so many ways across the, the river, river Valley. And, uh, and that's how that partnership with Kaylee and the folks over at Orleans Southwest Supervisory Union has been so important. And, and we know no matter where you live, you, for whatever reasons, you're gonna go to the areas and the services that are most comfortable for you. So we know that means a lot of folks from all over are gonna be coming to the Morrisville area where there are a lot of hub of services and support. So, um, and if there are things that we're missing, that's where this conversation with you all is really helpful. If there's some organizations that need to know about information that you've heard us share, uh, or you think can contribute, we're, we, we love adding new connections and partners. So um, we appreciate you bringing that up because it, it, it presents some challenges when we have to start looking at those boundaries. And we'd like to kick the boundaries down rather than getting uh, caught up in them. Okay, great. And it's so confusing too with the schools, right? Like some of your schools, like some of the schools from your supervisor union are in our area and some of the schools from your supervisor union are not. So Adam's always wondering if like he's getting my emails, you know, so it's confusing. That was my, my first of all, um, it's truly incredible how quickly and nimbly your organization has um, put this together. And it's wonderful to get your emails, Emily. There's always so much information um, and it's so accessible too, which is difficult with all that information sometimes. Um, I'm just curious how your organization has partnered with um, or worked with the Hardwick Neighbor to Neighbor group because there are quite a few things that are similar in terms of what, and there are lots of neighbor to neighbor groups in your area. So what um, kind of how you collaborate or, or not. <laughs> I am gonna share a screen here because I will say Hardwick, um, oh, sorry, am I muted? No, Hardwick and, um, Cambridge and Stowe have had particularly strong um, town assistance groups. So we made a whole separate page for them. Um, Hyde Park also, you know, the, the ones that really had really strong town assistance groups. And it's interesting, like Waterville needs something very different from us than Hardwick. You know, what Hardwick has needed is, um, you know, a lot of those collaborations around housing and food, we're certainly pulling them in. And I think, I don't have the list in front of me, I think Hardwick got some of the freezers. We got funding for these freezers that basically are gonna function as the freezer version of Little Free Pantries. Um, and I think I think the, the maybe your food shelf got one of them. I'm not entirely sure, but there was, yeah, there was some place in Hardwick that got one. So, you know, Hardwick has needed less, yes, less of us um, because you guys do have a strong community network. So what we've tried to do is respond to you in a different way. When we got these freezers, that involved our planning group, our public information group, reaching out to government, um, ended up involving several different organizations. Capstone took it over. Um, a freezer was useful to you. While you may not always need some of the other things we're able to provide. I have a question that in the last five years, nobody has been able to answer. And I don't expect you to have this off the top of your head but maybe you can find out the answer to it. And that is what percentage of households in Vermont do not have good, well, I won't even say good, do not have access to the internet. Mm. 
There's a map, Riz, and I, I can't pull it up right at this. I, I can find you the map. There is a map, and they've done a huge study on it. Um, so I will follow up with you. I just made a note right here, but there is a map that covers that. Thank you. But, but Wiz, you bring up such an important one, one uh, more of an anecdotal, I can't, um, I don't have the specific numbers, but, uh, uh, and Wiz, I, I love your name. I was, I just was, I was just dying for you to have a question for us because I wanted to be able to see, is that, was that the name that you, or is this just like a pseudonym for uh, your Zoom calls? Um, but it's a great question. Um, you know, it's the real thing. It's the real thing. I, I love it. It's the real thing. Um, this was a really important question uh, at the end of last school year when um, obviously our schools were going remote. So we did check in with each of the three supervisory unions. And, um, you know, what, what we were finding is that Lamoille South and Lamoille North were somewhere in the 80 to 85 percent range in terms of families connected to the schools and having a reliable uh, connection to the Internet. When we talked to our partners in the Orleans Southwest Supervisor Union, they said that the range is really somewhere between 50 and 70% who have ac reliable access you know, to the internet. So one of the specific projects that Emily and I were able to work on, we, um, Lamoille South uh, identified having phones with hotspots would be a way for families to have access both for their children in accessing school, but also to get connected to the resource page uh, on, for the United Way. So we were able to secure funding from, um, uh, from the Vail Resorts, their foundation, the Jewish community of Greater Stowe, partnered with the Lamoille South Supervisor Union and able, were able to distribute these phones. So in our schools, I have to say, have done an absolutely incredible job in terms of getting access for households who have children in schools. Um, there are some communication districts that have been developed and are using the information that Emily is sharing um, to really figure out how do we you know, uh, reach out and do a better job in terms of uh, reliable, and I think that word's really important, reliable access you know, to the internet. So, and thankfully COVID brought that much more to the attention um, of the whole community rather than those who are just suffering without a reliable uh, connection. And Wiz, I found this page by going onto the United Way page, going to internet access, and then I used that to end up whoop, up here, which now is um, okay. here and then here. So if you go, it, any questions like that, pretty quickly you can find it via the resource page. Okay, so you want to know the, the the lowdown on the name? Oh, yes. I'm going to give it to you whether you want to know it or not. <laughs> um, I was named Elizabeth for my paternal grandmother. Uh, and when I was brought home from the hospital, my older brother, who was three at the time, could not say Liz, which is what my parents had planned on calling me. And my grandmother did not like Liz or Lizzie. She had been Elizabeth all her life. And my parents weren't about to start calling me Elizabeth because Elizabeth lived next door. So grandmother lobbied that they should stay with, with Tim's version, which was Wiz. And so here I am. Love it. That's I'm hanging on to it. All right, thank you. So I wanna say thank you to you guys for, for sharing this. I had never seen the, the web page. Of course, I've read the emails, which I find informative. And it does make me think that if we don't, we should have a link to that on our town website. And we should also, the one person that I'm thinking really should have, uh, have the cards is our town service officer, Larry Hamill, who is the one that gets the people in the you know evening who are like, I don't have a place to stay tonight. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the, my, my two thoughts um, on how to continue distributing. Yep. I've got a note right here. Awesome. Those will probably be in hard work tomorrow, Eric. That's that's how quickly Emily operates. I, I should say Monday. I'll say Monday, yeah. Emily. Well, I, I was hoping to go out to breakfast in hard work this weekend. Oh, so maybe go. I'll drop them by. That'd now that I'm vaccinated, I can do things like that. Yeah, it's great. Vaccination is great. Everybody should do it. Yep. Thank you guys so much for taking time to talk to us.
Yeah, it's great. It's very educational. Thank you. Have great a good night. You, folks. Thank you. you. Wiz, nice to meet you. My youngest son couldn't say Cecilia. His, he, so we keep, the name for his sister was Yaya. And that is my favorite name for her. Yaya. So <laughs> I love those stories. Folks, have a great night. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. All right. So my um, next item is number two, which is to, um, there's an, a vacancy um, on the OCSUED um, board, which formerly known as the elementary school and um, or schools. And uh, so we have uh, at least one person interested that the, the um, that board has put forward um, Kevin Moore as a as a candidate for replacement. And as every probably everybody remembers that um, when we went to a union um, model for the elementary schools, the select board now appoints when there's a vacancy. So it's on us. We've done a couple. Kevin was a member of that board. Did he, was he the last man in and so he got bumped when it was turned into a union board or why is he no longer on it? Or is he just renewing his seat maybe? So I believe was, so Kevin, to my knowledge, was a part of the transition during that merger of the board, but stepped off for a year. I'm not exactly sure why, but he was definitely on the board during during that process. And I, I would like to nominate him. And he, I think he was a great addition to that board. And I'd love to nominate him to um, serve. Do we know what year? Is there a term, Eric? I don't know. Hang on. Uh, I could probably find it. Um, it's the, I believe it's the remainder of, o, I think it was O-Rise who had to step down and it's the remainder of her term, I believe. Hang on. If you want me, I can, if you want to hang on a sec, I can probably find it. Yeah, so just a bunch of emails they'd like to appoint him soon. From that was from Catherine Ingram, who's chair of that board. Um, O'Rise urges us to appoint him. Uh, hang on. Maybe oh, shoot. We could make the motion and then and then add it. I second. So a motion that we appoint Kevin Moore to the OCSUED school board to complete the uh, term previously held by Orise Ainsworth. I'm pretty sure I'm right that she stepped down. I really would like to find that. Or we can amend that to just be appointing Kevin Moore to the OCSUED school board. Oh, yes. Okay, I found, yeah. so yeah, O'Rise resigned. She needed to resign. Yeah. So yes, he's to serve out the term, O'Rise's term. I think that's great. So we had a motion from Kaylee. Sorry, I was puttering around in my email. Do we, do we have a second? second? Yeah. Second from Wiz. Any more discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All right, that's everybody on the ayes. So motion carries, thank you. Um, next up is uh, item three, select board to discuss the police department budget for fiscal year 22. And I don't know if somebody is in a position to share that, maybe. I can if you give me just a minute. That'd be awesome. Um, I'll say in um, prelude to this discussion that I met with um, Sean and Aaron and Casey Wednesday morning and just talked to talk this through a little bit. And um, I, I 
learned a few things and I think there are a couple things that are sort of late breaking that, that we need to keep in mind as we look at this. And um, one is that Aaron and Casey are looking at um, a grant similar to the COPS grant but for retention. Um, so there's possibility of some funding there. And um, also some of us watched and maybe some of some of the other board members watched a webinar that VLCT had this week about um, how we might spend the ARPA money, the, the uh, COVID relief money that's coming to the town. And one of the ways that we could spend that money seems to be, although there's not final ruling yet from treasury, but it seems to be that we could spend on um, uh, emergent or um, first responder type people who had to have um, uh, um, course or face to face interactions with the public. So certainly the police would fall under that. Anyway, food for thought. So this is the budget. So um, uh, I can just say, as I recall, that um, the Bob, so Aaron and Casey have gone through this and um, have this proposed budget with a fair decrease in base payroll um, and it totals out to 700, well, almost 750,000, which is approximately 70, it would ends up being a, running a deficit close to 75,000, I think after losing like the 220 or 230 in Greensboro revenue we had in our original budget. So it's gone from that. This, this proposal takes us from a, a deficit of over 200,000 to a deficit that's more like 75,000, I think. Anyway, that's I'm my- 45 to 75. We, sorry, say again, Casey. It went from 245 to 75,000. So, um, comments from people, questions. So I know we talked a little bit about this at our last meeting, but just so I understand. So if we're looking at the, the $78,000, it sounds like some of that we're trying to make up for with additional grants for revenue would that cover it, or is that what i understand eric yeah and your I question just have a quick question please yeah go ahead michael um with the loss of the two hundred thousand dollar revenue from the greensboro area what was the cost of providing those services in that same time frame So it's a little bit of a complicated question to answer. I don't know that we have direct, I mean, maybe Aaron can, Aaron, please speak up if you have other information, but I don't think that we have um, like a discrete, a breakout that shows a discrete cost associated with Greensboro. Um, the way I've thought about it in the past was that having the Greensboro contract allowed us to have a fully staffed 24 seven police coverage for both towns. Um, I don't, can Aaron or Casey, do you want to comment on I, that, uh, Michael's question? I can comment, Eric. I don't, I don't know if I'm accurate or not, but I, <laughs> I can certainly try. I agree. Um, you know, Greensboro was a, um, you know, a population based 24% uh, rather than an actual cost base. Um, and if, if I'm saying that right, if, if it's understood that way, whereas it was not on actual, actual costs, it was on a, per, on a um, uh, population based percentage, which included uh, population of year round and also the summertime population, which increased uh, dramatically and that's how how it was was based which is a very common um, uh, very common calculation that's used uh, I, I know in 
in policing uh, with sheriff's departments when they when they police out for you know different towns etc uh, and that's that's kind of how we um, did it as well we're the only town in the state of vermont that uh, contracted out to another town uh, which is a bit of a unique situation as well so thank you very much yeah so unfortunately it's not an easy one to answer so i guess i would further comment or Kay kaylee it looks like you're getting ready to say something go ahead <laughs> go ahead eric oh jace i feel like i should shut up i'm doing all the talking I guess my question was in this again as we talked about this the last meeting but also kind of directed towards Michael's question is it seems like what this budget is showing us is is a de decrease in expenses in order to maintain this current 24 seven coverage is that right Aaron. Yeah, uh, Kaylee that's correct it this would still maintain the 24 seven coverage, which everybody has been accustomed to. Um, and so this is without the Greensboro revenue, but uh, as you know, we were down uh, one officer uh, as it was, which we did not fill uh, given the circumstances that we're under. So we, we did not, you know, move to fill that position as well as we have uh, one officer on deployment currently and another, another going on, uh, a six month deployment uh, for basic training. So uh, we didn't fill those positions. We have been trying to, our plan is, you know, to utilize part-time where we can uh, to help keep those costs down and still maintain uh, the 24 seven coverage, which everybody has, um, you know, certainly been accustomed to over the many, many years. So this um, reflects, I mean, further Aaron explained to Say that this also reflects um, shifting around some staff to cover the shifts um, as well. And I think a question that's maybe not a question for tonight, but is something that we definitely need to ponder is that, you know, yeah, it's, it's so maybe tonight we could agree or maybe we won't but um, one could cert a reasonable approach to this could certainly be like well you know close enough like it's the cost is down the coverage remains what people are accustomed to and there's possibility for grant funding filling the gap um, so I guess I'm open to however the board wants to to go from there on on the fiscal year 2022 budget to me, the bigger question is what happens in November when we start crafting a budget for the future? And do we, and I think this has impl direct implications um, on Aaron's end for staffing as well. Um, do we continue like with, a, with something like this budget? And what, what we're not seeing here is Aaron's staffing plan, like, um, uh, but, you know, basically he's got, pulling in more part-time help, you know, pulling uh, an officer who wasn't, uh, who was dedicated to detective work back into a, a, like a rotation of people being on uh, patrol and that sort of thing. So, I mean, there's changes here beyond the budget that in, in order to support this budget. And then, so my question, I think the bigger question moving forward is, do we stay with the department like that, or do we try to go back to a more regional um, model where like, you know, I know um, Sean has said that Wolka has reached out a few times. Um, so maybe there's a possibility of providing coverage there, although they already have coverage from the Wild County Sheriff. So, you know, that's not a certainty, you know, Greensboro has in their Several people from Greensboro have reached out and who were disappointed with Greensboro's decision and said and noted that the Greensboro contract has some performance based things in it that measures that the Orleans County Sheriff will have to meet. And so, you know, there are folks in Greensboro who hope to see Greensboro come back under Hardwick PD, but all these things are 
unknowns and i don't even know like do we just does it is it best for hardwick to be in the business of regional policing or not and i think that's the bigger question and it's not the question for tonight but anyway i had to say it the other thing eric that i you know i just need to add is i i have got some emails um you know we've discussed this too about the barton orleans area um, oh right i continue to be you know, contacted uh, from that area. And, you know, just, I guess I'm kind of looking for a little bit of direction from the board as to, um, you know, where to go with that, um, you know. With that Barton Orleans yeah, question? Yeah, 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 certainly. The, you know, the, the last communication that I had was that they were, you know, looking for, you know, certain hours of coverage of an officer, et cetera. And that the officer would respond to uh, calls for service during the time they were in uh, Barton Orleans. So, um, you know, certainly, you know, that could be a revenue shortfall, but there's also issues with that as well. Um, you know, if they're responding to, uh, so if it's, so if it's simply a traffic issue and, and we're sending up the, someone up there to uh do traffic to you know try and and meet our budget shortfall etc um certainly that can be done with a part-time officer if now we're looking for them to respond to calls uh, for service while they're doing traffic then that's a whole nother dynamic to where a part-time officer may not be able to um uh, so, it, you know, a part-time officer may not be able to respond to those calls because they are limited by statute as to uh, what they can do for arrest uh, without a full-time officer. Uh, so, you know, at this point, I really, I, I'm not seeing that as a fit for us. Um, but if the board says otherwise, then, um, you know, please tell me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking for some direction there, but I really think, you know, our focus at this point would probably be a bordering town and that is going to be the best fit for us. Um, but, uh, you know, certainly, certainly tell me otherwise, if you want me to pursue something different or whatever, but uh, I'm not recommending that at this, at this point in time, not recommending the Barton Orleans issue. Uh, given the geographic um, and and the fact that really I, I don't feel that a part-time officer is now going to fit into that role if they're responding to calls, uh, they they certainly do have some crime issues in that area, as I you know as we've seen a recent some bank robberies uh, et cetera, and um, I I would prefer or recommend at this point that we uh, concentrate on this year this budget and uh, work towards a, bro a bordering town, so to speak, uh, for, for the, next, the next time around. Yeah, Aaron, I, I just, it's, I know how difficult it was to get close to what we asked for, <laughs> which <laughs> is making up for that revenue. And that's, I, I know that's really tough. So um, it's amazing that you, that, you know, you've worked with Casey and Sean to get pretty close pretty close to what it would be, what, you know, just Hardwick would be not including Greensboro revenue. Um, yeah, I agree. I think the, um, we talked about this at a previous board meeting, but um, one of the benefits of having Greensboro was it was a neighboring town. So you could, um, it wasn't, you know, taking an officer away for eight or 12 hours. Um, Orleans and Barton is really far. So I, I have some concerns about that. Um, but just to going off of what Eric was saying, I don't, um, I think what we asked is for you to do this and it was it's great to keep getting this budget and keep seeing how it's being worked out um and i don't know if we can you know just because it's such a tight because it's so tight without that revenue if we could be including it in casey's updates um i think that would be helpful at least for me to see um and then also to your point, Eric, about next year, which is not that far away budgeting wise. 
Um, I have some concerns about budgeting for a contracted town that we don't know we're going to have yet. So, um, and I don't know how the timing of that is going to work out with our budgeting season. I don't think we have to have that conversation tonight, but um, you know, it seems like we're, we're doing what we can for this year. And I really appreciate you doing that. And the question of next year or years beyond that is something we don't necessarily have control over. And so um, I wonder if we could have a, another conversation more about, more about yeah. that um, once we get a little bit closer, maybe once you have more information from some of those area towns. Yeah, so I think that that's a good summary. And, and really, I feel like tonight, the important thing is, is the, and, you know, it's not necessarily a vote thing, it's more of, I think the board generally agrees kind of thing, but is the budget, as Aaron has proposed, Aaron and Casey is, have worked through this, and Sean, is that, is that sufficient right now for us to be getting on with, basically? knowing that there are potential um, grants out there that could help get the remaining um, gap covered. I don't um, usually think of myself as taking the conservative position, but when it comes to this sort of thing with money, I think that going with this budget and working over the next five or six months to figure out what really works for next year um, is the conservative thing to do rather than planning that we're going to get something else or hoping that something turns up just look at this is what it is now and this is what we have to work with and this is where we're going to go forward with it and keep our eyes open but not assume that any any coke bottle is going to fall out of the sky for us I would agree with that, that going with the budget as proposed is probably a good idea, as well as the prohibitive nature of dealing with the Barton Orleans area from a policing perspective. I would absolutely agree with Chief Cochran that that is just geographically prohibitive, if nothing else. It's asking a great deal of the officers to travel that far. Yeah. Um, it takes a lot of time. I think, Sherry, do you have a comment? So Yes, I do. Um, so the COPS grant that is, uh, what does that tie us into if we were to choose to? Yeah, it's more of a recap. That for uh, the shortfall, um, does it have, you know, those so grants? What are the strings? Traditionally are stringy, yeah. So Casey's looked into it. Uh, she described it as more a retention than in a, um, a retention grant. Then Casey, do you, or Aaron, either one of you, can you comment on more on that grant? I, I can report on that if, uh, if that's okay. Yeah, great. Okay, so we did get information late this afternoon that um, it looks like the retention grant is not necessarily going to be a fit. So for full disclosure, that's something that we're not sure about. The American Rescue Plan Act monies, as Eric has indicated prior, uh, it looks like there is an opportunity uh, based on what I saw from the Vermont League of Cities and Towns uh, PowerPoint presentation earlier this week, and that is available as a recording. So the select board members could review that and we can get the link to you. First responders, uh, the time for first responders during the state of emergency we effectively could re get that reimbursed. Um, you know, the town has to decide moving forward, obviously, when we get additional guidance, how we want to spend uh, the monies that are coming through the American Rescue Plan Act. And as a friendly reminder, uh, the information provided to this point would indicate that the town of Hardwick is going to get a direct allocation of $280,000 that we would have to obligate how we are going to spend it by December 31st, 2023. We have to spend it out by December 31st of 2026. Eric saw this same presentation. His and my interpretation was it looks like some of this time might be pertinent. Why does this matter? It basically would allow us to put some of this time back toward salary and time that we've already paid in this operations year to uh, basically what that does is bolster 
our, um, you know, bolster our budget and it allows us to uh, carry, you know, some of that fund forward, if I can say it that way. Everybody knows here, we basically go year to year on our budgeting processes. But the other thing I think is important in this discussion to note is that, you know, we have, we have years where in various departments, some are over, some are under. And uh, I'm just gonna call this point out, um, you know, we've been a little bit under on the PD budget we anticipate being a little bit under on what we had budgeted for this operation season. So uh, as you all know, in these budgeting processes, I'll just repeat it. Sometimes we're over, sometimes we're under. I'm just going to say this, you know, what the ask is at this phase is we are trying to sort out what we can do to cover the $74,000 gap that we see right now. So we can invest effectively in our human capital. I'm just going to say it. We can invest in our human capital, which is our officers, we can maintain our operations in the 24 seven environment with the thought process now, and you all have said this well, you know, we've got to evaluate moving forward what this is gonna look like. Are we gonna be continue to be a regional police force with the information at hand from the operations perspective, myself as a town manager and Chief Cochran uh, as the chief, until we hear otherwise, that's how we are going about this tactic. We are trying to work with neighboring communities to continue this service uh, for the good of you know, our community and the ones that are surrounding. So um, you know, that's the elevator pitch. Okay, so that's the COPS grants thing. So that seems a little bit um, shaky, of course. And then um, I, yeah. I mean, I, I, well, I appreciate, you know, shaking out the, the shortfall and working out the budget. I think that um, for the, for the future budget for the 2022 20, to 2023 thing, you know, this, we're in 2021, 2022, right? So for that future budget, um, it would be, I think it would be um, a perfectly good reason to schedule um, a special town meeting and have a community discussion about policing in Hardwick. I mean, after the 4th of July, things are potentially opening up and we could potentially have a, a community discussion about it. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think that is the bigger question is what, what do we do next? Then at town meeting, they have to vote the budget in or not. So if we've just gone ahead and decided one way or another, it would be nice to not have to, but you know, it, I think it would be good to have a community discussion just so that we can take the temperature of the Hardwick community about this. Right. I agree. I'm not sure that, that a town meeting is the a special town meeting is the way to do that, but maybe I think not. Maybe it's just a public forum, but or yeah, no, no, maybe. But there, yeah, we should probably. I agree that we should try to find a a way to gauge um, what the community wants. Mm -hmm. And so, just to um, one quick thing, I, in response. I want to make a point, Eric. And that is that we have a fat fund balance that if all this grant writing and everything doesn't work, we have the money to fill the gaps. Yeah, we're, we're actually in a really good position due to um, some pretty good advice, I think, and so some good fiscal responsible management of all the departments. Um, that the town is actually in good financial situation and can weather this. Um, I uh, we just wanted to respond to one thing Kaylee said about um, the unknowns of partnering with neighboring communities and uh, um, the way that that's worked in the past with Greensboro is we've always tried, it didn't happen this last time, but we've always tried to work on a contract in the fall so that the contract is yeah. agreed upon and signed before we have our budget done. So if we were going to go that route, we would want to go that route relatively early. Yeah. So that we knew we would we would go into the but we would 
finalize our budget knowing we had a contract with another community if that's what we proposed. And if we didn't know that, I would say we wouldn't include that in the budget. Yeah, I, I think the reality of our situation is that we're for our next budget season, we're budgeting for a Hardwick only police department. Unless we choose to, to work with the neighboring communities. We have a contract from neighboring communities. Correct. Yeah, and I think it's important to keep in mind that neighboring communities don't include 45 minutes away. Yeah. Um, you know, just one small point, you know, that I'd like to make, Eric, is that as we consider this and, you know, and we think about the future, et cetera, is, is also to reflect on the past. Um, anybody who read the, you know, Gazette from uh, going back a couple of weeks ago, the article that, you uh, <clears throat> that was done in the Gazette about uh, 1970s, 1980s um, yeah. in Hardwick. And I think it's, you know, important to reflect on uh, where Hardwick was uh, with a police department at, of that size, why they decided to change uh, to a, a larger department, and to reflect on the fact that um, there are still uh, major crimes from the 1970s uh, that still plague us today, um, unsolved crimes. And so I think it's important to reflect also, um, you know, this is not a question just in Hardwick. This is actually a question. I, I, I did a bunch of internet research um, and this is a, a question across the nation. And looking back to, uh, you know, as far as the 1960s and 1970s, um, policing across the nation in small towns. So, um, you know, it, it, it's a very big issue, and um, I certainly don't want to see history repeat itself um, in, you know, in, in, in increased crime rates, et cetera. And so there, there's certainly a lot to consider and think about and also reflect on uh, where we were and where we are now and what we've come from, uh, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, I think it's an important consideration. I think that a lot of I mean, the police department has changed. A lot of other aspects of the town have changed in the meantime. So. Um, but, okay, so that's not for tonight. We'll discuss that later. Um, one thing that Aaron did just ask for for tonight is um, a direction on pursuing the um, Barton Orleans thing or the Barton thing and Sherry's shaking her head. Kaylee's shaking. Everybody's shaking their head. And Michael's already chimed in. He doesn't think it's good. I'll just say that in my thinking about it, the only way it makes sense is if um, if Aaron assigns a completely additional part-time officer to go up and do a discrete amount of work, and um, and there's um, a prof a reasonable profit in it for us. But it's hard to see how that would work for them because then cars are going and no it, no it just everybody's saying no yeah. clear enough is that good enough for you aaron that's good enough for me I, I i don't disagree with you in any way i uh appreciate the um you know the opinions and um i that's the way i would like to you know to move forward and uh, again i appreciate um the opinions that every everybody has and support as well. So, um, just so everybody knows, the reason that this keeps coming up to us about Barton Orleans is that we do have a select board member from Barton who keeps reaching out. He reached out to me um, this week, so, and he's been reaching out to Aaron and Sean. So that's why it keeps coming up. Um, so. Just to sum up this discussion, select board is sound, I believe, is generally agrees that marching forward with the plan, you know, knowing that things are fluid, but with a plan, uh, with a plan budget as proposed, will work for us for the coming fiscal year. And we'll, um, and we'll work toward um, a policy decision at some point in the future about whether we're pursuing um, 
whether we're pursuing a, a, a going back to a community like a sorry to a regional policing thing and for that we we will try to figure out a way to gather community input are we still going to take a look at the what the possibility would be with um shifting to a different kind of not 24 7 but 24 7 using the sheriff's department for the overnight or whatever are we not did we throw that out um for did we ever it, check to see what that would cost compare comparatively um aaron or casey or sean Let me check it, Aaron. Well, just just one thing I wanted to mention. So you know, so we're looking at um, currently a say a seventy five thousand uh, dollar deficit, uh, which was completely unexpected um, on all of our parts to uh, maintain twenty four seven coverage. Um, when you start bringing in an additional agency, um, you start dealing with information sharing issues and uh, community issues as to where your community does not know, um, you know, your other agencies coming in. And I can probably guarantee you're looking at more than a $75,000 difference to hire another agency to cover certain hours during um, those particular shifts. So it would be my recommendation that we would continue forward with the 24 seven coverage as we um, have as long as I've known of since 1980, uh, anyways, um, in Hardwick, and that we would, you know, continue to move forward and try to navigate how we could do that and really keep that as our goal, um, at least for Hardwick, uh, whether or not we did that for other communities. Um, but, um, you know, we certainly can, you know, reevaluate it each quarter and go from there. But that, that, that definitely, you know, when you're talking $75,000, I, I can tell you it, it will cost much more than $75,000 to bring an additional agency in to cover certain hours that, um, you know, we wouldn't, wouldn't be able to cover. And there's a lot of other logistical issues that go into that um, as far as information sharing, as, as I said. So I, it certainly would not be my recommendation to go that direction. I know we probably want to move on, Eric, <laughs> um, but it would be helpful at some point, Aaron, I know you've got a lot going on, but it would be helpful to see this to the budget's helpful, but it still doesn't tell us the staffing breakdown and like how many of those are part-time officers and how many are full-time. Maybe that would be the place to, I think what Sherry was trying to say, which is what is the difference between hiring all in-house people to provide 24 hour service, which, I don't believe is that 75,000 deficit. That's whatever our budget is now. I don't know if that's what you're saying, Sherry. Um, and then just what I think having it on paper and having it in the minutes. So that way we can refer back to it as need be. I don't think it's um, like, we don't need to do that for the next meeting, but I think it would be really helpful, especially if we're going to have a community meeting to be able to show this is the cost difference between us doing this in-house just for Hardwick and us doing it with the sheriff's department or whatever, because I'm sure that would be a question. And so if we could prepare that in advance, then we could answer it quickly. Um, and and then also the cost difference, which was Michael brought up before, the it, we know from Greensboro that it was roughly $240,000. I feel like we have an opportunity to be pricing out what it would be for other surrounding towns again, not immediately. So that way, if we had a contract, we could at least um, understand a little bit more how that would impact our budget. So I don't think we need, I'm not trying to like add a ton to your plate. I'm just <laughs> trying to think forward is how we can get as much information as we can to be able to make decisions um, in the fall. All right all good stuff and this needs to be an ongoing conversation so thank you everyone i'm going to move us on um next item is item four update on the yellow barn and um 
I asked Minty Conan to join us for this discussion. Um, she's the chair of the NEKDC board, and you probably know her from Caledonia Spirits. Um, and so I will try to give a quick run through of where we are with Yellow Barn. Um, as I'm sure everyone's aware, it's a complicated, it's a complex project in terms of its funding, its ownership, and, and all the details. But basically, the, the structure is the town of Hardwick owns the property. Um, the, the intent <laughs> all along has been to lease the property to the, the Northeast Kingdom Development Corporation, the NEKDC. And um, the NEKDC is then going to be the entity that, that is responsible for managing the tenants and so forth. Um, the on the funding side, um, there I, I'm going to call it three major components. So the town gets grant monies. The NEKDC is borrowing the loan monies, and the tenants are contributing private funds. So those are the three main categories of funding, um, and. Um, uh, right now, what's happening is we have, um, I hesitate to say we have all the funding committed that we need because we haven't gone out to bid yet, so we don't know exactly really, but we have um, funding committed sufficient that we're ready to, to move ahead. And um, so the first step in that is actually to uh, take for the any. KDC to take a loan from the Vermont Community Foundation in the amount of approximately 425, 450,000 and um, use that money to, what is it? 452,000. 452 and use that money to um, pay for continued design and engineering that will bring us to the um, bidding phase. So all the all the design, all the engineering, the bid documents and getting it out to bid. Um, it takes us through all that. And then there's another round of borrowing when we get beyond that and we move to construction. Timeline on all this is um, hoping to close on that loan from Vermont Community Foundation as soon as possible, meaning tomorrow or Monday or something like that and start using those funds. The design team is already confident enough that that's coming through, that they are working full bore and um, hoping, uh, planning to be out to bid, I think July, August, August maybe. And then um, selection uh, and working out, hammering out details in September for an October groundbreaking. So I feel like I've been droning on here a little bit. Um, can I offer something, Eric? Yeah, please do. Um, just so everybody hears this, uh, you know, Minty is running a business and she has been a part of our, you know, at, uh, on behalf of NEKDC, uh, she has been involved with our weekly planning meetings. The Yellow Barn uh, planning team meets weekly. And to its credit, we've held to these weekly planning meetings through the pandemic and prior. And uh, Minty has come on board in this last two and a half month period. And um, she's really, uh, you know, been giving us a lot of support and is committed to this project. And uh, I just want to say thank you. This is, uh, uh, you know, everybody knows uh, about a, a shift in location for Galdonia Spirits, but Minty is really about making sure this project does go forward, you know, for Hardwick and the surrounding area. And I think this is a really important part of this conversation. So I just want to say thank you, Minty. So uh, you've put a lot into this oh. and um, it's, you know, it's going to be a good project for Hardwick and the community moving forward. It's my new second job. Didn't you know that? <laughs> <laughs> it's yes. great. So, yeah, I'll just say a few words, though. It's a great team. Um, you know, any of you can join any time. It's um, been a real, it's, it's, it's the best economic development project in all of Vermont. I've become your biggest advocate. Um, and when Eric says that it's complex, I've done a lot of financing over the last 30 years. And this is the, this is the most complex one I've ever seen between all the grants. And you've done really well with the grants. And... 
we're just about poised to borrow the 452,000 so that we can pay the architect. We already owe them money. So we need to do that. Uh, we need to sign a land lease, which you guys are gonna see. Um, they're requiring us to have possession of the property. That doesn't mean we own it. It just means that we're um, an interested party in that property. Um, and then the next step will be to secure the construction financing which is with Vermont Economic Development Authority and Vermont Community Loan Fund and Northern Community Investment Corp, three different groups. And that will take us through 2022, hopefully. Um, and then those loans will be paid out mostly except for VITA by new market tax credits. So it's a real opportunity for the town of Hardwick, as you well know, to gain jobs and to grow and to have a beautiful asset as you enter Hardwick. So um, we've gotten a lot of attention and hopefully, um, I, I think we're just almost there with the financing. So uh, it's been really great. So we're looking for your support on um, supporting the ground lease to start. Uh, we're signing for the debt. So that's not town of Hardwick. We're taking the risk um, because we believe in the project. I have a great team on NEKDC. We're um, raring to go. So hopefully this will all transpire. Yep. Um, and the just, whole team of Caledonia is excited about it too. So just so you know, we're gonna have a, we're gonna have a location there as well, so. I just wanna make sure I get into this conversation and I should have started with this, is that I have joined the, the board of the NEKDC and that was mostly to provide a, um, a connection with what I know and, and to provide the viewpoint really for the town of Hardwick, I think mostly. So, um, yep. uh, so I, I guess I don't really view it as a conflict in this in instance, but I want to be completely transparent that I also am sitting over on the other side. And I think as a consequence, I'm going to abstain from voting, but I am going to ask the board if, if you'd be willing to vote on uh, having the town manager enter sign for the town for the lease for the property that's in our, it's in our drive. I sent it out just today. I'm sorry, it was late, but we were trying to get a final copy. Um, and I should note, it got updated to two things. I should note, one is Bill Davies re, uh, reviewed a draft of this earlier and two that there have been a couple changes, but the most substantial one was decreasing the length of the lease from 60 years to 49, because apparently if you lease for too long, you can incur um, Vermont property transfer tax, which is not it's, really it's something. It's as if you sold it, it. but we don't, yeah. we, we want you to still own it. The property will be owned by right. town of Hardwick. Yeah. We have no interest in owning it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, I mean that's not a bad thing. I'm just we're we're not we're not an investment company. We are economic development company only. Yeah. Right. So, um, what you you want a motion to authorize the town manager, whoever he the, may be, the acting town manager, whichever, to sign um, any and all legal documents needed for the lease and for the bidding phase? Does that work? We don't, uh, we can, we don't need the bidding okay. phase yet. Oh, okay. Then for the- For the, for the closing, you know, it'd be great to say any and all legal documents required for the closing of the Vermont Community Foundation loan. Okay. Yes. So move. That's what we need. Second. Thank you. So we have a motion and a second. Do we have a discussion on that? I just have a quick question about the document, please. Yeah, I understand from reading the document, please, some clarification that the loan that's going to be procured by the NEK, the, the yep. development court, is going to use the yellow barn as collateral, though they don't own the barn. Is that correct? Can someone clarify right. that for me? That is completely right. correct. That is so right. That is actually what's happening. Yeah. Because the town owns the building. Right. And curiously enough, um, in addition, there, 
So as just so everybody knows, as this project goes forward, there are going to be so many liens on that property because in addition to all the loans that Min Minty just rattled off, a bunch of our grant funders place liens on it as a way to hold us to doing what we say we're going to do when we propose the project. So there's already a lien on it from Northern Borders and they're going to have to... Um, uh, there are lawyers working with their lawyers to make them uh, second, right, secondary to the VCF loan, I think, and that happens right somewhere. But we all want to see this um, do what it go. it's going to do. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we do. Yes, you do. It's it's such a great project, and the fact that the their Jasper Hills planning to double is just phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, more questions, comments? Wow, you guys. All right, so I'm going to call the vote on the authorizing the town manager to sign the documents as necessary for the Vermont Community Foundation loan closing. So all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, so I count four ayes. I'm going to abstain. And so the motion carries. And thank you very much. And um, I'll try to do more freak. We'll try to do more frequent updates because things are getting rolling. I mean, I'm it's moving. really moving yeah, now. And I can come anytime exciting. if you need. Yeah, if you need anything, if you need anything, I I can come anytime. We're we're spending a lot of time in between those Thursday meetings to get this done. We're going to have a just so you a little preview, we're going to have an operating agreement that we're going to draft between the town and any KDC to, to start to formulate the relationship of the building and how it's managed to, um, the, to the relationship with the town, what the town has to do, what we have to do, just to clarify everything. So that'll be coming down. And I'm sure you'll have something to sign when we do VITA and, and Vermont Community Loan Fund. There'll be other stuff, no doubt. Um, but the, the big thing is to get it going where um, we do have concerns about the cost of materials and you've heard that in the news. So we're really um, worried about that. We've, we've managed to gather a huge amount of money and we're hoping it's enough. And um, so that, that's probably the only risk point with this project is that the, something that we couldn't control, which is the economy and the border and all that is May, may, it may cost us more, but it's it'll it'll happen because we're very determined. So, okay. Well, thank you. I don't I don't think I need to stay on for anything else, right? No, but thank you for joining, Mindy. Thanks a lot. Yeah, no problem. We'll talk soon. Yep. Yeah, bye. Bye. Um, all right. Thank you, guys. It's a complicated. <clears throat> project. Next up is item five, select board to consider approving final draft of the illegal burning ordinance. So I do have a question about this because I did all the research on this thing and I looked at a lot of other town ordinances um, and it was about half and half, the ones that included the actual contact information for the, uh, the fire warden in the area of the town. Um, and I, I see that Bill Davies felt like that maybe wasn't necessary or something, but I'd like to see that go back in. I mean, I, I, Sherry, I think, I think the detail there was maybe not mention the current assignee by name, but just reference oh. the position. That was what I interpreted there. Okay. Huh. In case it changes. Did I, I guess in case it changes, although how long has Doug been it? Yeah. Um, Casey, do I have that right? An attachment. Yeah, he so, said just probably, you know, you could, when you put it up on the website, you can just do like an attachment of who the current person is, but don't make it part of the actual ordinance. Otherwise, you have to amend it if the position changes. Or I see. Changes. Okay. Okay. That makes sense then. So, so I had a, I had a couple things. Um, I did review the, <clears throat> the uh, ordinance uh, final proposed draft. Um, I, I had a couple things in there. The, the most simple one um, that I would like to mention is that it shows a maximum penalty, but it doesn't have a waiver penalty in it. Uh, most of our ordinance 
ordinances, um, you know, include a waiver penalty, which would be uh, essentially what a what a uh, municipal ticket would be written for. Um, it, it only includes a maximum fine um, of five hundred dollars. It doesn't include a waiver fine of um, I would generally probably, you know, in, in my experience, I've seen a waiver fine of about one hundred dollars in um, ordinances similar to this, um, but it, it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, you know, reflect any, any waiver penalty as far as writing, you know, the ticket for that. Um, that's the most simple one. Um, I know Sherry did a bunch of research on this, so hopefully it's fine. It's just meant that I didn't find it in others, but <laughs> right. I'm not, I'm not super attached to that. Yeah. So, so, so that was, you know, that was just a quick, uh, thing that I found there. The other uh, thing that's a little more complex that I that I read is under Article Four, which um, authorizes us to enter, you know, a property. Um, that one concerned me more, so I reached out um, to our town attorney as well as a couple other attorneys because, in our experience and training, is more with criminal law than it is obviously with civil law. This is a civil penalty. Um, under criminal law, we would not be allowed to enter the curtilage of a property without a uh, warrant to do so. Uh, fire departments and fire wardens have um, different authority than us when it comes to responding to uh, complaints of burning fires, etc. So I did reach out to uh, Bill Davies. I was able to reach him today. Um, I understood that he had already reviewed the ordinance. And so I, I asked him about that particular section, uh, which, which does apply to us. You know, I, I addressed to him, you know, my concerns as, um, as a question, somewhat in, in uh, uh, civil law rather than criminal law. And his explanation was that um, under civil law, we would be allowed to enter the property uh, without a warrant, uh, which is different than criminal law. Um, however, he did recommend or didn't recommend rather that we were named as a primary and rather that the forest fire warden or fire department would be named as a primary and us as a secondary um, on that, which stills allow us to take enforcement action if necessary but that the uh, forest fire warden uh, really was, was his recommendation uh, be named as a primary um, under that section, if that makes sense. That makes perfect sense and I absolutely agree. Aaron? Yes. I don't understand the concept waiver file. Fine. Sure. You, know, you talked so, about it has a maximum, but it doesn't have a waiver fine. I don't know what a waiver fine is. So a waiver fine in a civil, civil penalty, such as anything to do with a traffic ticket or a municipal ticket, which is the same as a traffic violation. Those are called civil penalties, not criminal penalties. So civil penalties um, always have a, a minimum and a maximum and a waiver. Um, so the waiver fine is what a ticket is written for by the officer. Uh, the court, should it go, should the, the ticket itself go to the extent of a court action? Uh, so should, should a ticket be written in this case and go to the judicial bureau? then they would, the judge would have the ability to um, assign up to a maximum fine of $500. But the officer themselves would have the ability to assign what is called a waiver penalty, uh, which would be, is generally much less. Um, however, it does allow the judge, so the $500 would be a maximum fine, as it's stated in there, and that, that allows the, the judicial barrel or the judge itself themselves to, um, uh, you know, give that fine up to that maximum. But it gives us 
um, a, a direction as to what we can assign on a ticket itself. And so if the person were to pay the ticket, they would pay the waiver penalty. If they were to take it to court, uh, the judge has the ability to um, increase that fine to the maximum. Thank you. Sure. Um, any, so do we want to amend the policy to have the waiver fine listed? Sure. <clears throat> so does it, does that mean that, um, we have to send it back to Bill Davies for another draft or can we do that ourselves? Um, yeah. How does it work? I think my impression, Sherry, was that that I, I don't think it needs to be sent back for anything. Um, you know, a waiver fine, all of our other ordinances include a waiver fine, uh, even even going down to the parking ordinance. Uh, which so can you direction. just can you make that adjustment to the to the to the draft draft, I guess right. that I, that's my understanding is it would just be oh. a matter of making that adjustment to the um, to the draft itself and, and just including what a waiver waiver penalty would be um, in that draft so the, the five hundred dollars would be a maximum you would decide what the waiver penalty would be you know as a board um, and that would give a direction and also it doesn't in this particular um, sense the you know the police department obviously or a police officer can obviously write um, a ticket under the statute a municipal ticket under the statute and under the the ordinance but also the forest fire warden can also be given the ability or um, you know can obtain we can assist them in obtaining a uh, number to be able to write um, a municipal ticket under the judicial barrel and mm -hmm. Uh, be able to write those as well we you know we certainly can can um, facilitate that in happening as well so it it doesn't necessarily have to be us um, to write a ticket the um, forest fire warden certainly can do that as well they just need a number which we can help facilitate that through the judicial barrel as well I didn't mean to complicate things at all. I just, <laughs> I just wanted to make sure that we had a solid ordinance in place. And, you know, being much more used to criminal law, um, I was concerned about that that part of the the ordinance. And uh, criminal law wouldn't allow us to to enter without a without a warrant. I was concerned about that, and certainly didn't want to bring the town into any liability in that particular situation. So, and that's about entering the. A structure versus entering the like the yard where they're burning trash or something no or no that's anything so they consider the curtilage of someone's property and they say the curtilage is is, is basically the outside property not not Boundary. the structure yeah. yeah so so that's where my concern came in and and i was unsure um so i did did reach out to bill today um to kind of get the differences between criminal and civil there um to to get it so you so you have an understanding now of how the wording needs to be changed in order to make it possible because the whole point of the ordinance of having an ordinance is to be able to potentially curtail Ill illegal burning right and in bills um when i talked with bill his his recommendation was was the change of from the police department being primary to being secondary and the forest fire warden being primary that was his his recommendation of the change um it doesn't change the fact of you know that that a, that a um, municipal ticket can be issued um really can be issued by either person and we can facilitate the forest fire warden with doing that um but it, but it allows us to do it even if we're secondary just that um it it simplifies things a little bit because, um, you know, obviously people look at us as um, criminal enforcement. So when we show up, uh, the concern is that there's a thin line between criminal enforcement and civil enforcement, and that um, it, it probably would be a better uh, image for the 
forest fire warden to be listed as primary and a police department to be listed as secondary. Doesn't change the fact that either can, can issue a ticket, either can be called. Um, it's just a matter of the, the way the ordinance is, is worded is, is really how, how it boils okay. down. So who actually changed, changes that document? Can you do that? Can you just change the wording as it needs to be if we if we all agree that this is we can go forward with this? Yeah, who, well, whoever, yeah, it, it's it's a pretty simple matter of changing, you know, adding in your um, your waiver penalty and then um, changing the police department from being primary to the force fire warden being primary, police department being secondary enforcement. Um, uh can I ask a quick question, please? I have a question, please, Aaron. Uh, yeah. With the police department being the secondary contact, if they were to be contacted first, would they then contact the fire department or the forest fire warden to facilitate entrage, entering onto the property? Um, not, not necessarily. At times, Michael, we have gone, you know, we have received those calls and we have gone to see if, um, the calls are just a matter of someone burning brush, et cetera, rather than calling out um, trucks, et cetera. Um, it doesn't, you know, it, it's kind of a discretion call, I guess, um, when, when it comes in. Okay, thank you. So it sounds like we need, um, we, still are, we still need a final draft of this. Like we thought this was a final draft, but we're gonna have some edits. Can, can we, um do the final draft next time or do you want to try to do a motion to approve the ordinance now with the edits i kind of would rather not do it on the fly because it sounds like the language needs to be there but what do you think i don't care i would agree that the language needs to be altered first before we approve or disapprove okay. So let's do it once, do it right. But um, we'll, so the next time we'll look at the final, final draft. And my hope is that Aaron's going to go ahead and make those edits. But yeah, Aaron, can you work with um, maybe work with John on that next week or the week after or the week after that? Yeah, I think, you know, like it's, I think they're fairly simple a um, couple sentences there. So I, I really don't see it as being. Um, anything very complex, um, pretty, pretty simple changes on that aspect. Yep. Yeah. So, but our next, yeah, our next meeting is the back, uh, third Thursday in July. Or no, it's June next time, isn't it? You're, you're skipping way ahead, Eric. I am. I am so far <laughs> ahead of you people. All right. So, all right. So if we could have something for June the third that would be awesome yeah i i don't see that as any issue on right. my part anyways i i don't uh, you know i yeah whoever wrote it up it's i don't have a word version of it but i i certainly can work with whoever has the original word version and and we can add those in pretty simply Barry's talking on mute i will send you the word version or Casey probably can I, as well. Yeah, I I have the most recent version from yeah. Joe. Yeah. Awesome. Great. So we'll see you next time. Thank you. I'm going to push us to item number six. Select board to discuss length of um, Hardwick Electric Department commissioner terms. And um, as probably everybody recalls, when we met with the Hardwick Electric um, Board of Commissioners, one of the suggestions that they had was that as the, uh, due to the um, technical nature of the business of Hardwick Electric, they felt it was beneficial for all terms to be three years. And they pointed out there's nothing in our charter that prohibits that. So um, that, was, that was their suggestion. I believe currently we, Somebody help me if I'm wrong, but I, I believe that, so there, I know for sure there are five people on that board. And um, I think three of them have three-year terms and two of them have two-year terms. Is that correct? Anyone? 
Kaylee thinks yes. So um, this discussion is to consider- That's the whether, way I remember it. Okay. To consider, I mean, we could have them be uh, any length probably, but they, the Board of Commissioners was recommending a, a three year for everyone. Eric, can I ask a quick logistical question? Yeah, go ahead. If we're potentially opening up the charter to change our lister process, yeah. is yeah. that we is that an opportunity to make any other changes like this? It is. I don't know that this one needs to be in the charter. I think it's probably better if it's not. But it is it currently? No. No. Oh, okay. No. So it, there may be some other there may be there may be some other items you want to evaluate in regards to charter just for good of the conversation. So I believe there's a whole list, but yep. I mean in general, I think in my experience on the board, what I found is that the less that's in the charter, the better. Mm -hmm. Honestly. How are the terms staggered now? And if we if we agreed to change from three three year into two year to five three year how would that transition be made did they have any ideas about that in terms of like when we appoint and all that it seemed like yeah. they when I mean, they presumably proposed... you don't want everybody to be serving on the same three-year term so some are going to, and with five three-year terms, at some point, you're going to have at least two years when you've got two people going off. And yep. what's, did they have a suggestion for what that schedule should look like? Or were they just making this request and it's us to, up to us to figure that out? Uh, kind of came up in conversation. I think it's up to us. Um, that we could look, I believe they're currently but staggered already. I thought that Lynn had said that um, because they're staggered already, that it would just naturally, um, it would, can, the, st the staggering of the terms would continue even if we did make them all the same length because of the way it's already set. So uh, I think the, the one thing in our charter is we're not supposed to have, we're not supposed to appoint more than Per year or something, we are supposed to have them staggered. It just doesn't. It doesn't say what the terms need to be. Just that it's staggered. The in, the intent is you don't have a majority of the board turning over in a given cycle, just like it is for the select board and other we have uh, boards. Memory. Yes, that's the intent. But on the select board, we actually do have it set up so that right because we have two one years and three three year seats. So every time. You maintain a quorum, though, right? Or no? Is that wrong? Oh, sorry, I misinterpreted that. Well, again, the intent is to try to maintain quorum of institutional knowledge, as Sherry said it. I guess to just to play devil's advocate, the the um, if if there were a situation where the select board was not happy with the um, constitution of the board of commissioners, or then it's the only once appointed, um, the only way to remove a commissioner is for cause, which is a relatively high standard. Um, and so it, it does give less frequent opportunity to affect change if change is required or in the eyes of the select board is required. Just throwing it out there. But I'm fine, whatever, and we don't necessarily have to decide tonight. It just would be nice to decide before we appoint for the next for the um, July. So what they were suggesting is that the people who are two year terms just be given an additional term to their two years and just yeah. let them roll off. Yeah, or maybe uh, we could just decide. I mean, another way to do it would be to to when the two year terms come up for reappointment, then we say, well, we're reappointing for a three year next time, next time that seat comes up. 
we should look at the, the current staggering and make sure that we have to figure out how it works if we want to do it so that the staggering works. Something I do better if I have it on paper in front of me. Yeah. Yeah. The the uh, the current assignments are available on the website, but we can get yeah. that information to the board, of course. Oh, uh, we can look at it too. Yeah, right there. Yeah, it's up on the website. Um, that's that new item that we created, yeah. so we have everything tracked right now. Yeah, it's great. Let's table it till next table time. Table it we have next time. time. In uh, we have time before we have to reappoint in July, right? We do, and we can, um, even if we miss that July, everybody continues to serve until they're replaced anyway, so. Would it be helpful uh, to ask Lynn to give us a schedule so that way we can see? We have, we have the schedule on our website of when the terms expire. For the new, for the, what they're proposing? No, we have for the current. And I think what we should do as homework is we should look at those and say, what happens if when those two year seats expire, we change them to three year seats, do, or do we have it so we're never appointing more than two in a year? And we can do that for next time. Yeah. Sounds good. I like that idea. Um, so I'm gonna move us on to item seven, select board to consider approval of the new relocation cost of employees policy and revised conflict of interest policy to meet federal guidelines. Are those both to meet federal gu guidelines or just the conflict of interest? Both of them. Um, so just a little background in our last couple of years audits, there's been some comments made about specific policies that did not meet uniform grant guidance, which is the federal guidance. And obviously we get a lot of federal grants. So it's really important that we update our policies to follow the uniform grant guidance. We're in the process of doing this. So we have seven of them to do, but we're kind of presenting them to you a little at a time working on them. Um, these ones have been reviewed by our auditors and sort of given a blessing that they would um, you know, meet the criteria for the UGG. So that's what we presented to you is the versions that they said would meet those criteria. Do we, do we currently have a relocation cost policy? No, we don't because it's, we're a municipality and we don't really relocate employees. So you'll right. notice on, on the policy that it kind of says that, that the odds of this happening um, are very unlikely, but in the event that it did, this is what we would do. So um, yeah, we, we need to- We have still it. have to have the policy, even though yeah. we don't have it occurring. Yeah. And they were in favor of, you know, sort of wording it in the beginning that because we are in one location, this really isn't something that, that happens, but in the event that it did, this is what how it would be handled. So, oh, uh, I see. So it's not, it's not paying relocation costs for somebody you're hiring. This is, no, this like is if like if we told, yep. like this, this is if like we told Kenny, like you have to now go run the wastewater treatment facility in Johnson or somewhere farther away, then we would have to potentially would have to pay to move him if we relocated him. Like that's a crazy example, but something yeah. like that. Correct. Which we would never do. <laughs> Correct. Okay. So how about um, I make a motion to approve the new relocation costs of employees and policy and the revised conflict of interest policy? I second. I think I beat you, Wiz. I don't know. I heard Wiz. I saw you, Kaylee, but I heard Wiz. <laughs> it's that fast internet you have, Wiz. That's what it is. That's why that's why the, the stock traders get close to Wall Street. I'm in, um, yeah, I'm in the village. Um Casey, uh, can I just offer uh, Casey and uh, Amanda um, put a lot of uh, effort into this, these two and then the other ones that are gonna be coming. So I just wanted to say thank you. This takes a lot of administrative time to make sure these things are in order. So they've been doing a great job, uh, you know, looking, researching information, getting these updated. 
and then communicating with our audit firm just to get their blessing. So I just wanted to say that tonight. Did, did we also get a um, legal opinion or just an auditor's opinion? Just an auditor's opinion on these. Um, so we have a motion in a second. Um, my other question is what has changed in the conflict of interest policy? Because I didn't see like a, like a track changes version, for example. Um, so basically it incorporates the specific items that, um, actually I'll pull it up here and I can tell you. Um, okay, that'd be great. Okay, so in the beginning, it cites the specific, um, oh, I can't think of the reference in accordance with two CFR. So it specifically cites the section in the uniform guidance there. Yeah. Um, it gets a little more, um, where's the other section? A lot of these are just definitions that have not changed. Um, the, where's the other one that's, um, talks about, oh, I'm gonna find it, something about, oh, in the purpose, yeah. it talks about in the event of a federal award, specifically in that first paragraph. Okay. And then other than that, there's not really too many changes. It kind of just brings in that um, reference to the uniform grant guidance. Okay, so the two main changes are a reference to the uniform grant guidance and the in the purpose that we explicitly talk about the in the event of a federal award, the town of Hardwick shall disclose in writing any potential conflict of interest to the federal awarding agency or pass through entity in accordance with applicable federal awarding agency policy. Yes, and okay. this one also has a little bit more detail about um, in section our article 11 about enforcement. This has additional items that our other one did not. Um, so we use a combination of the references to the uniform grant guidance, our existing policy, and um, a sample policy that BLCT had as well to, to create this new one. So it was a compilation of those three sources. Okay. Yeah, and right. for the good of the conversation, what triggered this is, uh, you know, the original auditor's comments that uh, these things should be updated. Just so uh, when we circled back and said, is this, you know, they, is this the right uh, adjustment? So as Casey framed it earlier, you know, we've gotten their blessing that these would be pertinent, uh, assuming the board approves. Great. All right, we have motion in a second. Do we have more discussion other than my laborious questions? All in favor of approving the the updated um, policies, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Daily, did you aye? Yeah, okay, so that's all five, that's everybody. So motion carries, thank you. Um, next is, where are we? Item eight, update on pedestrian bridge conversation about community input, so um, I guess the two big updates here are that um, uh, since we got, I can't remember, we got some sort of letter, we did not get a, a grant award. We're still I can, waiting. I can here. update. You want me to update here? Go ahead. We, we just got the correspondence uh, yesterday that um, our, our grant application, this is the USDA Rural Business Development Grant, is uh, that's an eligible, it is determined eligible. And what we have in that, I'll just, I can read this back if that's okay, Eric. You know, what our community development coordinator got from uh, USDA Direct, this came uh, today actually. I've confirmed the eligibility letter provides that we may begin project work. If we are not successful in our grant award and we choose to move forward, any items that would have been reimbursable would not be reimbursed. So obviously up to this point, we've, um, we've had some, internally we've had some questions about, you know, when do we launch our community charrette to uh, just figure out, you know, what do we want uh, the bridge to be moving forward? Uh, what this letter of eligibility spec, uh, 
codifies, excuse me, is, you know, if we want to initiate that community charrette process, we can do that. It doesn't jeopardize the decision on the grant, but just be advised uh, town, you know, you're taking that cost on at the local level. It's not a reimbursable grant expense. That's it in a nutshell. Question about that. So um, it would become reimbursable if we receive funds after, is it July 1 that that what is the date in which we would you expect that we would know we don't know they have pushed back they they've pushed back the decision date i know up to this time we had indicated that we should have a decision in may and what they're indicating in the correspondence now is uh late june to july on the decision on the award they're still right. ranking the uh, grant applications they have received a uh, point of clarification uh, we can start this process it doesn't jeopardize our grant application uh, if we decide to do the community charrette, um, then uh, it would be, uh, it's not a reimbursable expense, to be clear. We would take that on uh, as our own expense. So if we decided that we wanted to at least start to plan for that for, say, the end of July, August, then that would still enable us some flexibility if, like, we could still schedule it and figure yeah. out who we want us, who we want to help in that process without really paying for anything until we actually do it. Is that like we can, is that how I understand that? So we could still have it be reimbursed or work towards the grant if we waited to pay whoever we have. No, it doesn't get reimbursed. It's not part of the grant because it's not, we didn't write it into the grant explicitly. Ah, ah, okay. That part, that little part isn't as explicitly in the grant anyway which is um so you know it just it's it's an expense that we'll incur as a town yeah per the uh, usda contact your application you may begin the work however your application has not been selected for funding scoring still proceeding any cost incurred at this point or at your own risk i mean that's the exact wording from the usda office yeah but it seems to me that this is work that we're going to want to do, whether we get this grant or not. Correct. And so yeah, and I'm. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So. Yeah, and I don't. Is, can I just say this? I don't. Yeah, go ahead, Wiz. I'm sorry. To put it off. Yeah, and I'm not saying. Uh, I'm not saying. Um, I just want to make sure this is on the record. I'm not indicating. Uh, uh, I'm not coming off here saying, "Look, we can't get the grant." Uh, we can't get this effort reimbursed. That should not be interpreted to mean we should not start this process. I'm not coming out about it that way. Just informing everybody, if we start the process, we would absorb the cost uh, separate from the grant. That's just the point I'm trying to make. So um, in, in this vein, uh, Sherry has previously reached out to, I believe, did you start with Vermont, with the historical people or I started with um, I started with Paul Costello at at uh, Rural Development or yep. whatever that be whatever that yes. is, um, and he recommended a person who is uh, David Raphael, who's a um, landscape uh, design and uh, what's his title? Yeah, landscape architect and planner. Um, He's a professor at UVM. He's um, worked on many projects and he um, uh, was uh, very interested. He's, uh, he's, so he's proposed, he submitted a proposal that I brought to the select board uh, a while ago um, that we still have and that he's been still interested in trying to help us out with this process. Um, and so the proposal is in the Google Docs now again. And uh, he would be working with um, Bob Neald, who is the um, engineer that the historic preservation people um, recommended have. So he was the second engineer that took a look at the bridge. So he's familiar with the bridge. Um, and so the proposal is, uh, a total of um, $3,800 to have a community workshop to plan for the bridge design. Um, 
and take a look at uh, how we could, you know, what, what the options might be with a prefab, what, what changes we could, you know, it, it p potentially make, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's, all, it's all really spelled out in that plan that he sent. So, yeah, I mean, in, I'm inclined to make a motion that we um, that we move to accept that proposal, um, and then see whether we can get something on a calendar for July to um, have a community event. It's a one day thing. It's not a multiple deal, but it's kind of an all day process. Haley, do you want a second? I actually, I don't want to belabor this too much, but I, uh, cause it is almost 830, but I, and I want to make sure that we're continuing with the bridge project. I feel a little bit uncomfortable just deciding to pay for this person. I feel like we should make sure that we have the process be what would it would normally be for hiring some like I don't know if we need to have an RFP process we um, don't not for under ten thousand dollars okay great and then um I just want to make sure we know where this thirty eight hundred dollars is coming from um so I don't know if Casey you know like right off the top of the head where that off of your head where that could come from um I think tonight we could probably say it could be general funds or something like that um it would just be helpful to I, I think it would be great to to know where that money is coming from and then um and then i would second it <laughs> so uh for the good of the conversation the board had previously authorized spending up to uh one hundred thousand dollars if needed out of the uh, fund balance and then uh, just point of clarification if the uh, amount is greater than five thousand then we have to go to bid but we're obviously under that so we're in a position where we could go we could select uh, the contractor the scope of services, uh, from my perspective, um, are sound, if you will, and it's a known contractor. So it seems like a reasonable approach from my perspective. Casey can better answer, you know, what's the line item we pull it from. Uh, but we had, uh, again, the board had previously committed. If we needed, uh, we could use uh, some additional uh, of fund balance, if you will. I would like to second Sherry's motion. More discussion. Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. We got, that was good. You did it when I pointed to you, even though our, my squares are probably different from your squares. All right. It's like Hollywood squares, Eric. It's like the it old is. school Hollywood squares. I know. Yay. Um, <laughs> thank you, everyone. Motion carries because uh, that was unanimous. And then we added an item nine, which was a liquor license, correct? Correct. Yep. It's um, a first and a third class for 41 South Main Street LLC DBA, the scale house. I would like to approve the uh, liquor license for the scale house, a first class liquor license. First and third. First and third, excuse me. Second. I knew you meant that. All right. And a second from Wiz. Any discussion? The scale house is maybe going to open again Memorial Day weekend. Has anybody right. heard? Mm, I did talk to Sven. I don't think I got a date. Did you ask him about that marketing analysis that we're looking for? I did. Uh, um, no. And we're, no. No. Can right, we can. <laughs> Any more discussion? <laughs> All in favor, please say a of approving the liquor license. Please say aye. 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 I think it was all five, right? And yes. Eighth. That was everybody. All right. Excellent. And then um, select board reports, new business, old business. Make it quick if you got something. I have a really quick old business. Sean, did we figure out where we could potentially put some porta potties? Is there? Oh, anywhere? we mi yeah, we missed that, didn't we? Um, I'm not going to make the determination on where we put porta potties. What I can share is the fee would be $130. Uh, I'm see sorry, $140 per month per unit. That's only weekly cleaning. Uh, one contractor is able to offer more frequent cleaning. 
my two cents is I don't think that's necessarily a good move, but uh, somewhat of a policy decision. So it, it's that, not a good move to get more frequent cleaning. Uh, it's a good move to get more frequent cleaning, oh. especially when it's a day like today when it's 86. Okay. So that's, that's it. I have had some, uh, that's all I would say at this phase. All right. So we'll, we'll, uh, you don't want to be that your, that be your last decision, John. <laughs> <laughs> How do I even respond to that? Where do we put the, where do we put the greenhouse? I'm just giving you well, a hard where do we put the greenhouse? Well said. <laughs> can, John, can this one wait? Do you have any dates for the roofs? Um, no, I asked Casey about that. We have secured our materials, Wiz, but uh, we've got to just pin down what the contractor is thinking in regards to the re, uh, asphalt shingles for uh, public safety and the historic depot. The answer is not at this time. I'll let we, you know. We, uh, what, what we can report is in our contract that indicated completed by October 15, but that really doesn't help us to know a better date. We, it's, but this is important. We have secured the materials. So the commodity, the problems with commodity pricing is behind us on this issue. That was awesome. Well, we had to lock the bid. We had to lock our shingles in, in, in a 24 hour period, if you can believe it. That's how volatile the market is. And they did use our local uh, pool and supply house, which was good. Any other select board reports, new business, old business? The only uh, thing we talked about last time was in-person meetings, whether um, what the plan was for that. Uh, yeah, we said we'd revisit that. And I'm and... in favor of it for June. Are we all, we will all be um, fully vaccinated by June, are we not? You can't answer that. People cannot technically be answering that. Just point of caution here. You can't really? ask that question. I volunteer, I volunteer the information that oh, I, I am fully I, vaccinated. Yeah. I volunteer. My point is, I point is I this. Also. Okay, check, just, <laughs> just hear me out. anybody that wants to attend the meeting. If That's back. my point. So to this <laughs> issue, yeah. until the universal guidance, assuming it is the same June 3rd, it's fine that we have the in-person meeting. We would just ask folks to mask up because we can't be asking, are right. you vaccinated or not? Just would ask, no, can you please mask no. up? That's, that totally That's my, that, that was my point. That they was can my point. wear a mask if they want to come. People yeah. are going to push back just so everybody knows. Well, I have mask. a quick question about that, actually. Um, would it be optional to wear a mask or required? Uh, the it way requires. the standard. OK, this will be a decision. First thing I'll say is this will be a decision for the board and the next town manager. Uh, as I have it right now, what, uh, what we have in place for office spaces is we are following the uniform guidance and what the uniform guidance for a business indicates is for a closed office setting, you, are, you should be wearing a mask. So that's what we have in place right now. What's in place June 3rd, time will tell. So as of right now, it would be totally legit for us to, um, to meet in person if everybody's masked, it sounds like. So we could assume, I think, that on June 3rd, we could be at least in that situation, we could have an in-person meeting with masks. Mm -hmm. And if the select board is good with that, and the, um, I know, Sean, you're not, you're, you won't be here, but if the town manager's office is going to be good with that as well, yep. then. Yeah. The other party here is Leaf, who I don't want to put him on the spot, but he needs to provide some input on this, not necessarily in the public meeting tonight, but uh, Hardwick Community Television needs to be in the game on this as well. Yeah, I'm here. Okay, right on. Uh, we're so, here at your service. The other thing I want to just throw out is um, if we're going to do in person, I think we can't also offer the Zoom option because right. logistically no, it's a nightmare. It's no, in person, it's but we're offering with a mask. and We know that. Until yep. we get technology such as a big TV that's actually going to no. work and people can hear no. us, then it has no. to be in person. We can't offer Zoom too. So We're just not going to do it. Full yeah. on in person. It's full on. It's in person. Right. And, and um, back to normal. And I wish that my last meeting could have been in person for the good of the conversation. Yeah, so, it would have been nice. Sorry. Sorry. I sorry I did not hit that, if you will. Would have brought balloons, John. I'm sorry you missed out. 
Um, I just want to say, could we, Casey, could we, uh, if that's a decision of the board, could we put out a front porch forum post or um, do a little bit more than just notifying? Because I think there are a lot of folks who have been used to looking for the Zoom link. So if we, if we just let people know that meetings from now on will be in person, but with masks and physical distancing, that might be appreciated. Sure, that would be fine. But they will also be on television. I also have a quick comment about the physical distancing aspect is if we have a large show up, which I doubt very much, how is that actually going to work with masks and physical distancing in a small confined space? We actually we did. have it set up already, Michael. Um, it's all spaced out. It's all the way upstairs in the memorial room. It's quite a large space and we do have the chairs all marked out on the floor so that if we have an audience, um, we are we can only have a limited audience just for capacity, but our audience is usually fairly limited anyway. So um, they are spaced out accordingly. We can host up to, uh, if the standard of six foot of spacing is still in place, which is what is in place right now, we could have up to 28 folks in that space. I don't think we've ever had more than 28 at any of the meetings I've been at in the last two and a half years. So I don't, I do not believe that will be an issue. I would and be willing the other to go along is, with whatever everybody agrees to, but I'm personally opposed to in-person meetings with a mask in place but I would be willing to forego my opposition. Thank you, appreciate it. Yeah, and the other thing is recognize we're back into our uh, warmer season. So obviously we can be open in the windows and you know, just cross draft and you know, that helps us all, of course. And the Hornets will be awake. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hopefully not They're so much. They're already awake. They're awake at my and house. This can be on television, right? People can't zoom in. But, but you can watch it. They can turn into the station or no? Right. Yep. They'll be able able to watch it on YouTube, on our website. Um, will we be on, live? Y yes, it will be live. Right. All right. Thanks. Uh, so next time we're going to, our goal is to meet in person, barring any unforeseen circumstances, any, any other new business, old business, or um, whatever reports. So I can call in and heckle? Is that what that means? Uh, you cannot, there will be no call in. <laughs> person. <laughs> uh, heckle. Just for a note, the townhouse we, we met last night, we cleaned and we're ready for officially opening on June 1st. And then uh, July and August on Saturdays from 10 to 2, we're going to do open house kind of a thing where people are um, there to maybe tour people through. We're hoping to get some people off of the uh, the LVRT maybe, or maybe have a impromptu music or something like that, but all will be socially distanced and all that jazz as the CDC rules go. Awesome. Anybody else? All right. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to adjourn. Thank you, especially another shout out to Sean. Thanks. See you guys. Thanks.